Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture, and it is my 10th year anniversary on YouTube. And you know, I know better than to try to create an overarching narrative around the records released in a specific year, especially when I'm just focusing on what I cover, or what I don't cover, or what fans just so happen to vote on for these anniversary videos. Oftentimes it comes down to the big, noticeable gaps where I just did not get to it on time, or I didn't have the same interest, or it just swings completely from out of left field. I mean, that's not narratively satisfying to me, nor all that interesting, and I know better than to assume it is for all of y'all. I'm not that self-important. But the three frontrunners for my anniversary video voted on by you this year did fall in interesting territory, at least to me. The first was from Sabrina Carpenter, considered by many to be a proper mainstream breakthrough given that she left Hollywood Records and wound up on Island. Given that I've never really cared for her sound and my reviews of her albums have been received resoundingly badly, I'm kind of happy that is not what I have to deal with here. The closest runner-up was the collab between Brian Burton aka Danger Mouse, and Black Thought of the Roots, the project called Cheat Codes. Absolutely a very good album that gives you precisely what you would expect of this collaboration, even if the combination of that album and seeing the Roots live at Pitchfork Festival in Chicago last year just kind of made me want to hear another Roots album. The last one was in 2014, come on. But the winner of this anniversary poll for 2023, I mean, I've talked about her before, although you might not have seen it given that it was in a compilation video back Back in 2018 when I was on vacation, and it presents to me probably one of the most challenging albums in which I've covered in these anniversary videos, yes including last year, and that despite having made 10 years of thousands of reviews, I still have so much more to learn. That's right folks, today we're going to be talking about the critically adored album from Natalia Lafourcade, De Todas Las Flores. I apologize in advance for the bad Spanish folks there's probably going to be a lot of it. Strap in. So here's an unfortunate reality for me as a music critic. I do not speak Spanish. Using deduction and a very rudimentary grasp of a couple common phrases, I can read pieces of lyrics, but as you all probably know, especially if you've watched Billboard Breakdown at all, especially this past year, I don't speak it. Part of this, and for an American-centric audience, I think this bears a reminder, I'm Canadian, we don't have Spanish education or that much exposure at all up here. We have far more exposure to French, which, if I'm being brutally honest, I'm not particularly good with either. The the larger truth is that I do not pick up other languages well. I've tried with French and Spanish, and at one point both Mandarin and Japanese on my own time. They just don't really stick for me. It's a big gap in my arsenal, and thus the big open disclaimer before the rest of this review is that I'm going to be relying on some translations here, and I just know poetic nuance will be lost therein. I'm not happy about it either. And you know what, that's kind of tough as a music critic, especially one who focuses on lyrics, because you know that there's a vast population around the world who do not speak English, but are expected to know US American-based music in English because of United States cultural hegemony worldwide, which is why nobody's particularly interested in me bitching here. And while you could argue in music that is changing with global audiences getting a lot more of a voice and seeing tremendous success, the larger truth, at least stateside, is that it comes in waves how much North America will care about music in other languages. With a larger caveat that if the tunes and the grooves, that if they're good enough, nobody's going to give a shit about the lyrics anyway. I mean, I don't like that, but that's the reality. But with Natalia Lafacade, it becomes more complicated, and not just because it's about great grooves or tunes. She's making a lot of stripped-down, highly traditional Mexican folk music, deeply rooted in the history the culture, and the various musical movements around Latin America. Now, I first discussed her work in the Musas series back in 2018, a blend of traditional material and a couple original compositions. And this was an approach that she would continue for her next two albums, the Uncanto por México duology, both of which were tied into the reconstruction of a cultural center in Mexico City that had been damaged by an earthquake back in 2017. Now, both of these albums also had a lot of guest stars, and showed La Focade venturing outside of her own comfort zone in order to embrace other variants of Latin music and Latin folk, like Bolero and San Jaroco. But this new album would be different, 
just her this time, all original material, her first in that vein since 2015, bringing in more sounds across cumbia, samba, and bossa nova for over an hour of textured, warm folk music all recorded near El Paso, Texas, analog. Can't say my fans don't give me a challenge on occasion. So what do I think of this? Well, it's funny. Despite all the preemptive caveats written before the album finally clicked for me, I find myself not really needing them as much as I expected, because this is an absolutely excellent album that even despite the language barrier, I found a ton to appreciate that only deepened once I translated the lyrics and found even more to like. It's intensely warm, textured, organic, and passionate. De Todas La Flores is the sort of rejuvenating listen where its central goal is to recapture a belief in life itself, and that then manifests that goal through some of the most colorful, varied, and joyous arrangements you're going to hear in Latin folk music, where even before I figured out what many of the songs meant, many of the melodic flourishes were enough to captivate my attention. In other words, uh, yeah, I, I get the hype. This is something special. I'm kind of kicking myself I didn't get to it last year. And what's fascinating is how deceptively simple this album can feel. Because the straightforward formula sprawling across subgenres of Mexican folk and Latin jazz wouldn't seem on its surface to throw any immediate surprises if you're experienced in those subgenres, especially sprawling over arrangements that all take their sweet time and space that they're offered. Running over an hour, I can see some perhaps not really having the patience to take this in, or thinking that it's not real that special or forward thinking within the space. I would kind of push back against that by saying that within the confines of genre, La Focade is pushing more than some might expect, especially in some of the more experimental flourishes and where she will create and push a song. But a closer analog might be a country artist like Jason Eady, someone who's working within a traditionalist structure, but refining it down to something both old and new, with a practice focus in the control of a veteran. And this extends across across the board in my opinion. While I could nitpick about a couple rougher vocal pickups, I can't deny that La Focade is simply a stunning singer in capturing grief, angst, joy, and wonderment as this album progresses, with a phenomenal command of dynamics in her voice. In the couple moments where the choral backdrops or a male co-star might join in the wings, they never take away from what is a very intimate and what is a very personal journey. And you know, I want to focus in on that next. Specifically, yeah, the lyrics and the themes. Again, insert the caveat that I am working from translations here, probably not very good ones. And there may be additional subtleties that I might have missed in the poetry. Because... From what I did get, there is a very defined arc with this album, starting from a very low point where it feels like every day is like a struggle for La Focade to keep on going forward. She starts off feeling insignificant in the tides of life and death, racked by grief, and thus the album becomes a healing journey within nature to rebuild and rediscover herself. Straightforward enough, it seemed like it would go down easy, but there are some layers here. I like how the title track describes a love so whirling and passionate that it can become toxic. The most vibrant and electric relationships can be the most complex or perilous, but it's also not one where the breakup will consume her. Far from it. There's a genuinely gorgeous moment of grace looking back on those times spent as she is the one to end it, but also how she had to find love for herself amidst the cacophony. And from there, she's both in conversation with herself and the vastness of the world at large. Songs like Levame Viento are very intimate in their framing, but show La Focade acutely aware of a world that seems impossibly big, and there's a humility that comes with finding one's small place within it. It's one reason I really love Pajarito Colibri beyond just the best individual melody on the album. Translated as hummingbird, in nature it really feels like it nails that thematic juxtaposition, and from there the album moves with a lot more confidence. There are more joyous and, dare I say, direct songs, there is more momentum in finding self love and now a newfound desire to love again by Mi Manera de Cuir, and then we hit Muarte, translating directly to death. And what I love here is that while there is some fear that comes of that stark ending, that's natural, where it once clawed her down, now it's a force that drives her to keep on living, that's taught her how to live, and where she'll be kind of comfortable to face it when her time comes. And from there, the sky's the limit in her passion. It's playful in her embrace of nature and those that might now behold her, but by the final song, 
you realize what might have been the root of her grief at this time. The loss of her nephew in 2021, where she wishes him luck on his passing and she's now able to move forward. I'm not going to say it's a revolutionary arc or theme and processing cyclical nature of life and death and family, especially coaxed through a lot of Mexican folk traditions, but in so nimbly balancing the intimacy and the scale in the framing and execution, I would argue La Fricade captures a breadth of the emotional experience that feels humanistic and resonant and very well realized. And the music itself, of course, is a huge factor for all of that. And while the instrumental palette is pretty consistent, all things considered, there are so many little moments I really appreciated. I love the subdued, hazy strings and that orchestration that opens up the album, setting up the overture that really resonates when juxtaposed with the very spare guitar, piano, and textured percussion around it that would follow. Yeah, it's a little rougher, but that kind of fits her feeling at her lowest point. Then there's the sultry, rounded restraint of the title track that builds to its choral drama impeccably well. And while I do do think the album slows down considerably for both Passant Los Dias and the windswept Levame Viento. In the former case, I like the subtle shuffling snarl that builds in the final third. In the latter, the flutters of acoustic guitar and horns are deceptively jazzy in their intricacy, especially in that transition to the creaking strings. Then there's the lush piano and strings interplay on the bossa nova of El Lugar Correcto and Caminar Bonito that's so endlessly charming. Then you have the electric guitar snarling across Maria La Curandera, Mi Manera de Cuer, it's this terrific horn and piano samba jam, and Muarte brings in flamenco guitar, trumpets, and piano, that later ignites into a howling jazz freakout that matches its dance with death itself. But I really like how the album ends, first with how joyous the borderline cha-cha of Canta La Arena is with its western flair and the guitars and the choral background that allow for the guitars to then peel out over a sandy expanse, and then by the return to the spare but elegant acoustics that just end this project on a really perfect note. The art concludes so well. But to tie it all together, you know what? I was expecting this to be a much more difficult experience. It's a long album, drenched in folklore and culture in a language I don't speak. It feels like I was being set up for failure. But I'll be damned if De Todas Las Flores is something pretty special. An utterly beautiful album that's incredibly easy to listen to, a genuine melodic flair, and superb production if you don't know the lyrics, and a very heartwarming layered journey of healing if you do. I would not really put this among my top favorites last year, Part of that, yeah, it is the language barrier, but this album does have patches that drag a little bit, that don't feel quite as sticky as I would personally prefer melodically, but it very could have easily made my top 50, and yeah, deservingly so. But what I appreciated most about this album, though, it's what I like most about being a music critic and a creator for the past decade. You steal yourself for a challenge, you find yourself disarmed by delight. And another door opens up to a space in which you don't know yet, but you can learn. I will never be able to cover everything that releases in the course of a year in my lifetime. There is more music than ever that gets released in the modern day. To say nothing of so much music history, I just want to discover. But when you find an album that reminds you of the rewarding possibility, it's on that horizon. Yeah, I'd call that something special. If you didn't hear this last year, give it a proper chance. And given that, hell, I'm not going anywhere, it's not my plan, let's see what the next 10 years might bring. We'll have to see. So yeah, thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I would be extremely grateful. This is where I'm going to be a little bit more off the cuff. Again, I've been doing this for about 10 years. I've got a couple more traditional video essays that are intended as my 10th year anniversary videos. Hoping to have one done in mid-August. Then there'll be, I want to say, two more throughout the rest of 2023. But beyond that, for those of you who have stuck around, thank you all so much for this. The average YouTuber does not last as long on this platform as I do, especially most of them normally give up at this point. I won't because I don't want to, and I've got more to say. It's the sort of thing where I know that I'm not getting the traction or propulsion that I may have back in 2015, 2016, 2017. And you know what? I'm kind of okay with that. It's moving at its own pace. And... I wish it would pick up a little bit more, of course, I wouldn't mind that added little boon, but if it doesn't happen, I'm doing it for me. That's kind of why I think it's special. Also doing it for you, it wouldn't be as many of you if I wasn't, but, hey, you know, we'll see where it goes. But beyond that, though, 
I also want to highlight that about a week ago, a, a fan of mine actually made a video why Spectrum Pulse deserves better. It's done by, I think, Beetlebat. I'm going to put a link to the video in the description. And it was basically uh, almost entirely accurate chronology of how my channel has existed on YouTube. And it did feel really surprising and really special. Uh, again, it, it kind of places into context the fact that I might not always understand the impact of what I do. And that is kind of surprising. Like, it's the sort of thing that forces you to sit back and take stock of it. I, I, it was very touching, it was very moving, that he did not have to do that, and I appreciate that he did. It, it's a little weird, I'll, I'll be very honest, um, to see you discussed as a topic of conversation, and especially when it's as a fan who wants my career to take off, but kind of gets where I'm at right now. I'm very moved for all of you who have stuck around for both the ones who are just casual viewers who check in for the year-end list or those who catch up for the occasional album that they think that I'm going to rant about or praise to high end. Or hell, those of you who actually just want to get in a little bit more deeply to support the channel. Link to the merch. Patreon's right over there if you want to get albums on my schedule. Or hell, argue with me on my Discord. There's plenty of that. And it's, not, it's never been an obligation. It's never been something that I feel like I wanted to make it an obligation. But I am grateful that those of you who have stuck around have. It's been 10 years. That's a decade. It's damn near a third of my life I've been doing this. I'm not inclined to stop. You can't make me. But beyond that, hey, again, folks, thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Let's hope 2023 continues on in a good direction. It'll be interesting to see if I get 10 more years. YouTube somehow seems like the most stable social network as we speak. Cross our fingers, that holds true. Until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse. I'll see you next time.